the residual fallacy. A common procedure in trying to prove discrimination with statistics is to 1. Establish that there are statistical disparities between two or more groups. 2. Demonstrate that the odds that these particular disparities are a result of random chance are very small. And 3. Show that, even holding constant various non-discriminatory factors which might influence the outcomes, that still leaves a substantial residual difference between the groups, which must be presumed to be due to discrimination. Since essentially the same intellectual procedure has been used to prove genetic inferiority, the choice of what to attribute the residual to is inherently arbitrary. But there is yet another major objection to this procedure. Not uncommonly, as the gross statistics are broken down by holding various characteristics constant, it turns out that the groups involved differ in these characteristics on every level of aggregation and differ in different proportions from one level to another. The residual fallacy is one of the grand non-sequiturs of our time, as common in the highest courts of the land as on the political platform or in the media or academe. At the heart of the fallacy is the notion that you really can hold variables constant, controlling the variables, as statisticians say, in practice as well as in theory. Controlling for education A commonly made claim is that discrimination is so pervasive and so severe that even people with the same educational qualifications are paid very differently according to whether they are male or female, black or white, etc. Holding years of education constant is often illusory, however, since groups with different quantities of education often have qualitative differences in their education as well. Thus, when Group A has significantly more years of education than Group B, very often Group A also has a higher quality of education, whether quality is measured by their own academic performance at a given educational level, by the qualitative rankings of the institutions attended, or by the difficulty and remuneration of the fields of study in which the group is concentrated. At the college or university level, for example, Group A may be more heavily concentrated in mathematics, science, medicine, or engineering, while Group B is concentrated in sociology, education, or various ethnic studies. In this context, claims that members of Group B are paid less than members of Group A with the same education, measured quantitatively, are clearly fallacious. Qualitative differences in education between groups have been common around the world, whether comparing Asian Americans with Hispanic Americans in the United States, Ashkenazic Jews with Sephardic Jews in Israel, Tamils with Singalese in Sri Lanka, Chinese with Malays in Malaysia, or Protestants with Catholics in Northern Ireland. Male-female differences in income are often likewise said to prove discrimination because men and women with the same education receive different pay. Suppose, for example, that we try to hold education constant by examining income statistics just for those women and men who have graduated from college. There is still a sex difference in income at this level of aggregation, and if we are content to stop here, the choice of stopping point being inherently arbitrary, then we may choose to call the residual differences in income evidence of sex discrimination. However, if we recognize that college graduates include people who go on to postgraduate study and that postgraduate education also influences income, we may wish to go on to the next level of aggregation and compare women and men who did postgraduate study. Now we will find that the proportion of women and men with postgraduate degrees differs from the proportions with college degrees, women slightly outnumbering men at the bachelor's degree level, but being outnumbered by men by more than 2 to 1 at the master's degree level and by 59% at the Ph.D. level. Clearly, when we compare college-educated women and men, which includes those who went on to postgraduate work, we are still comparing apples and oranges because their total education is not the same. Suppose, then, that we press on to the next level of aggregation in search of comparability and look only at women and men who went all the way to the Ph.D. Once more, we will discover not only disparities, but changing ratios of disparities. Although women receive 37% of all PhDs, the fields in which they receive them differ radically from the fields in which men receive their PhDs, with the men being more heavily concentrated in the more mathematical, scientific, and remunerative fields. While women receive nearly half the PhDs in the social sciences and more than half in education, men receive more than 80% of the PhDs in the natural sciences and more than 90% of the PhDs in engineering. We are still comparing apples and oranges. Some specialized studies have permitted even finer breakdowns,
but sex disparities in education continue in these finer breakdowns as well. For example, if we examine only those women and men who received PhDs in the social sciences, it turns out that the women were more likely to be in sociology and the men in economics, the latter being the more remunerative field. Moreover, even within economics, there have been very large male-female differences as to what proportion of the economics PhDs were specifically in econometrics, a difference in a proportion of ten men to one woman. In short, we have still not held constant the education we set out to hold constant, and which we could have said that we had held constant by simply stopping the disaggregation at any point along the way. While the disaggregation process must stop at some point, whether because the statistics are not broken down any further or because time is not limitless, the fatal fallacy is to assume that all factors left unexamined must be equal so that all remaining differences in outcome can be attributed to discrimination. In other words, having found causal disparities at every level of aggregation and often changing ratios of such disparities as well, it is arbitrarily assumed that the causal disparities end where our disaggregation ends, so that all remaining differences in reward must be due to discrimination. Innumerable historical and cultural differences found among many groups in countries around the world, as the numbered examples previously listed suggest, make statistical disparities fall far short of proof of discrimination. Such data may be accepted as evidence or proof in courts of law, but, logically speaking, such data prove nothing. They are AHA statistics. Mortgage Discrimination Statistics In the studies of black and other minority mortgage loan applicants who were turned down at higher rates than whites, some attempt was made to control for non-racial variables that might have affected these decisions by comparing minorities and whites in the same income brackets. However, anyone who has ever applied for a mortgage loan knows that numerous factors besides income are considered, one of the most obvious being the net worth of the applicants. Other data from the U.S. Census show that blacks average lower net worth than whites in the same income brackets. Indeed, even blacks in the highest income bracket do not have as much net worth as whites in the second highest bracket. Controlling for income gives only the illusion of comparability. That illusion has been further undermined by the fact that a widely cited Federal Reserve study on racial disparities in mortgage loan approval rates did not control for net worth or take into account the loan applicants' credit histories or their existing debts, nor was the adequacy of collateral included. When a more detailed follow-up study was done for the Boston area by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, it was discovered that, in fact, black and Hispanic applicants for mortgage loans had greater debt burdens, poorer credit histories, sought loans covering a higher percentage of the value of the properties in question, and were also more likely to seek to finance multiple dwelling units rather than single-family homes. Loan applications for multiple dwelling units were turned down more often among both white and minority applicants, but obviously affect the rejection rate more so among the latter, since they applied more often for loans for such units. Even among those applicants whose loans were approved, and the majority of both minority and white applicants had their loans approved, minority borrowers had incomes only about three-quarters as high as whites, and assets worth less than half the value of the assets of the white borrowers. Nevertheless, when all these variables were controlled statistically, there was still a statistically significant gap between the loan approval rate for minority loan applicants and white loan applicants, though substantially less than in the original study. Whereas 72% of the minority loan applications were approved, compared to 89% for whites, when other characteristics were held constant, 83% of the minority loan applications were approved. The remaining differential can be expressed either by saying that there was a residual difference of six percentage points in loan approval rates, or that minority applicants were turned down 60% more often than white applicants with the same characteristics, since a 17% rejection rate is 60% higher than an 11% rejection rate. The Boston Federal Reserve Bank report chose the latter way of expressing the same facts. Was the residual difference of six percentage points due to racial discrimination? After finding minority and white loan applicants different on all the relevant variables examined, can we assume that they must be the same on all remaining variables for which data are lacking? One test might be to examine the logic of the discrimination hypothesis and to test its conclusions against other empirical data. For example, if there were racial discrimination in lending, and yet most applicants in all racial or ethnic groups were successful in obtaining loans, 
the implication would be that minority loan applicants had to be more creditworthy than white applicants to be approved. And if that were so, then the subsequent default rates among minority borrowers would be lower than among white borrowers. In reality, however, census data suggest no racial difference in default rates among the approved borrowers. When the principal author of the Boston Federal Reserve Bank study, Alicia Minnell, was contacted by a writer for Forbes magazine, and this clear implication was presented to her, she called it a sophisticated point. When pressed, she agreed with the point made by the Forbes writer that discrimination against blacks should show up in lower, not equal, default rates. Discrimination would mean that good black applicants are being unfairly rejected. The following discussion ensued. Forbes, did you ever ask the question that if defaults appear to be more or less the same among blacks and whites, that points to mortgage lenders making rational decisions? Manel, no. Manel does not want to repudiate her study. She tells Forbes on reflection that the census data are not good enough and could be massaged further. I do believe that discrimination occurs. Forbes, you have no evidence? Manel, I do not have evidence. No one has evidence. This lack of evidence, however, has not prevented a widespread orgy of moral outrage in the media.